It's going to be a really full day. So I will try to not fly off. <laughs> Mock me. <laughs> By the way, you got a lot of compliments this morning. Um, this morning. Uh, oh, thanks. So I'm really glad I wasn't here. I don't take them well. <laughs> I don't. I get all sort of listed. Uh, so, um, so let's dive right in. How's that? We'll just tell stories. Stories. Yeah. No long, no long digression about something I already heard. <laughs> deal with you to your benefit. Or anything that will strike that alliance and alignment relationship. Then there, of course, are the characters who are indifferent. They cut their deals with other kinds of things. They, they, whether or not we gain advantage or disadvantage from their being in the world, they're not really, they're not really, they're not really doing it with us. Um, my favorite example at home is the oak tree and the squirrels. I like that example because the oak, the oak tree has cut its deal with squirrels. Whether we get any shade or benefit from the oak tree is incidental. But the oak tree doesn't care about us. It's not cutting its deal with us. Corn is cutting its deal with us. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. It's, it, 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 it's benefit, That's right? It's, it's Michael Pollard. And, and he's right about this because he's pointing at because But the third category, and this is an interesting one, is that, is that there are things in the world that are counter to your interest that are inimical to your interests, that want to eat you, that want to destroy you. They don't, they're not there because they're evil or because they're wrong, but because it's what they do. It's, it, it's not personal. It's like that crocodile and that parrot on the, on the, on the wildlife tour. It's just what they do. Um, the virus that gave you the cold, it's just what it does. It, it's, it's not about there being evil in the world, it's about there being polyvalent interests. 
interests that represent a diversity of different powers. And so there are powers that align with you, powers that are indifferent with you, and powers that are inimical or anti-you. And the word asura literally means an anti, an anti-god, an anti-force. Again, remember, the point isn't that they're evil. The point is that they've got a stake in the world. They have an interest. It just doesn't align with yours. It's, it's not personal. You just look like lunch to that crocodile. So, so that the demon takes the form of a vatsa, right, which is the word for a calf, is, is deeply oxymoronic. Like, it's deeply contrary. Because there's everything about the concept of a calf that resonates with the auspicious. And remember that auspicious is an easy category for us if we can invent it. It always means, it always means affirming, prosperous, and value. It always means those three things. So the first, the first let's go to prosperity because that's the easy one. So auspicious tree means abundance, prosperity. And the reason is, is because as the tantrikas see it, the universe is not a zero-sum game. It doesn't run out of affirmation. It doesn't run out of goodness, like, or love, or anything that is auspicious is generative. It creates more of itself. We all, anyone who has had the peculiar privilege of two children <laughs> knows this feeling because when, before the second one arrives, you're really nervous. Because you say to yourself, am I ever going to love the second one as much as I love the first one? Because you fall in love with the first one, and you wonder, and then the second one comes and you go, Shazam! There's more love! So, because you don't run out. It's not a zero-sum game. It doesn't, it doesn't run out. So that's the first sense of plenty or abundance is that, and this, and this is a really good indicator of how, of how to make judgments about resources. So for example, since we are homo hydrocarbonous, since we're human beings that depend upon <laughs> gas and oil, and we know that that stuff is a limited resource, what's auspicious about it is two things. The first is knowing that you're going to run out of it, which would be a way of respecting that resource. And the second would be that we are clearly looking in the wrong place, because there's always more shrink. And since we're looking at what is clearly a finite resource, we could be looking elsewhere where there wouldn't be the same parameters of <coughs> limitation. Because Sri is the tantric notion that there is always more. There's always more abundance, always more prosperity. The second thing Sri tells us is that we place a value on it. That we, we value some things more than others. That invokes all kinds of questions of discernment and discrimination and judgment. And don't ever think you're exempt from that, because even the decision not to judge is the decision to make a judgment. So we're always placing value on things. And there are symptoms of value. I probably talked about this with you at some way. But when something's important, it slows you down. When something is interesting, it speeds you up. And it literally will do that to your body. It will literally symptomatically appear in your experience. Just think about it. And that last principle of tree is affirmation. And that is that way in which the universe says yes to success. It says yes to that capacity to adapt and to become part and parcel of that essential way in which the universe moves itself along in what the tantric is see as a process of affirmation. Like, for example, the way, the way bodies want to live and then the way they decay so quickly when they die. Which is all a way of saying, you are food. You are part of a much greater conglomerate and of relationships and causalities and processes, and everything wants, as it were, to succeed. Everything wants to say yes. So John calls that the good. I call it affirmation. I think we're, we're exactly on the same page. 